innocent people don't get convicted and the truth would come out. But I also thought that I was de- dealing with a fair system. Hmm. I thought I was dealing with ethical prosecutors. I was thought I was dealing with ethical police. Objective judges. Uh, fair and objective judges who were not biased or swayed. Boy, was I wrong. Hmm. But to me, it was a death sentence. Yeah. Right. It's a death sentence. Yeah. And, you know, if I think back on it, um, they tried to kill me. Really, what they tried to do is there wasn't a death penalty on the books in you know, 88, 89, 90 in Suffolk County. But if there was, I would have been sent to death row. We and, you know, listen, I've walked back into the prisons where I was imprisoned at. And, you know, it, you want to feel anxiety, you know, the, the, the sounds of the gates, the metal gates slamming shut. And you know you have no control to open those gates. Very, very kind of one of those moments where you freeze for a split second. We'll, sure. We'll, we'll get rolling. Okay, um, for, th- thanks very much for sitting down. I appreciate it. Um, for anyone, anyone doesn't know, can you give us like a quick quick kind of bio, what you do or w- w- what you do now? Hi, my name is Marty Tankliff. I am special counsel at Barquette, Epstein, Kieran, Alday, and Laturco. And Garden City, New York, and Manhattan. I am also the proof, uh, Peter P. Mullen, Distinguished Visiting Professor at Georgetown University. And I also happen to be an exoneree who was wrongfully convicted of the murder of my parents in New York State. I was in prison for almost 18 years before I was exonerated. And I was freed on December 27, 2007. And since that day, I haven't looked back. Okay, so, um, yeah, obviously quite... Um She's quite, quite quite an experience. Um, c- can you give me an idea of uh, of what of what life was like before before you stopped living a normal life? Was a sure. I, I grew up on the North Shore of Long Island, New York. Um, I grew up in a relatively affluent area where you know we didn't starve for anything. Um, I everything happened to me on my first year, first day of my senior year of high school. Um, Sorry, you, you, that's 17, September 18? 7th, 1988 was supposed to be my first day of senior high school. And, and, and what age were you? I had just turned 17 on August 29th. So, yeah, I mean, and you know, it was about two years later on June 28th, 1990, a jury found me guilty of the murder of my parents. And a few months later, I was sentenced to 50 years to life. And if I wasn't exonerated, my first eligibility for release would have been October of 2040. Wow. So 2040. Yeah. We're, we would have been nowhere near it e- even now. Um, okay. So um, yeah. Um, c- kind of uh, affluent kind of area, uh, suburb. What, what, what did your parents do? What, what, um, uh, my parents were, my father was an entrepreneur. So growing up, he owned his own insurance company. Uh, after he sold his insurance company, he invested in a lot of different businesses and one of those businesses happened to be the bagel business with Jerry Stewartman. Okay. And it, everything happened to me because of that investment with Jerry Stewartman. Right, right. Um, okay, so you live, you know, f- f- fairly ordinary, f- fairly comfortable. Um, uh, yeah, it's it, it, it must be a tough thing to relive, but but c- can you take me back to the, the, the day it all changed? Sure. I mean, it was supposed to be... A normal day for me. It was supposed to be my first day of senior year of high school. Uh, I woke up and I discovered my father clinging to life. My mother was murdered. I called police right away. And instead of me being taken to the hospital where my father was, uh, Suffolk County Police brought me to police headquarters and they interrogated me. They say I confessed even though there's no videotape, there's no audio tape, there's no transcription, there's nothing. Uh, And the lead detective, K. James McCready, had a very shady past where he had elicited false confessions from other individuals in the past. And within hours of being there, nobody really knows how many hours I was there, I was charged with the murder of my mother and the attempted murder of my father. Uh, I was put into jail until I was granted bail a few weeks later. Okay. Okay, so um uh we you you, you walked in um 
how would they how would they have been um, been killed and injured? They so we don't know exactly. I mean, we know that knives were used okay. and a blunt force instrument. I see. Um, none of the murder weapons were ever discovered. Right. All we know is based on forensics and what some witnesses have said um, that it was a knife and some type of blunt force instrument. Okay. Okay. I'm. Um, I'm sorry. D- did you Did you wake up and discover them in in the house? Yes. Okay. So ha- um, had they been actually attacked? In they the- were. So my father had held a high stakes poker game the night before, where Jerry Stewartman was there. Um, and to give a little backdrop, Jerry Stewartman and my father were business associates. Uh, my father had invested in nineteen in the eighties over half a million dollars with Jerry. And during the summer of 1988, my father started to demand some of that money back. And at some point during the summer, my father became concerned for his safety. He was looking to purchase a shotgun for home safety. He told uh, a family member that he knows where the bones are buried and Jerry wouldn't fuck with them. You know, none of us really knew what that meant back then. Uh, We've come to understand that Jerry's son, Todd, was a drug dealer who used enforcers to commit violence. And that's how this all happened, is Jerry and his son reached out to their enforcers because one of Todd Sturman, who is Jerry Sturman's son's enforcers, was Joseph Creedon. And it eventually came out that Joseph Creedon was one of the murderers. Wow, oh my God. Um, okay, so... Uh um, I mean, but, but by the looks of it, had there been like a big struggle? It, I, I'd imagine there'd be noise. So you, you have to understand the layout of my house. So where I, my bedroom was, was on one end of the house. Okay. Where the house. poker game, it was, a very, it was a very long ranch house. Okay. Um, you know, I don't know how, how many square feet it was, sure. but it was a very long ranch house. Okay. So where the bedrooms were was the complete opposite end of the house where the poker game was. So whatever happened to the poker game, I couldn't hear. Okay. The other thing which most people couldn't understand is why you couldn't hear anything in my room. Right. So prior to my trial, we actually had somebody from NASA who was a sound specialist come in and do sound tests. Okay. Because when I was very, very young, my parents were looking to adopt a daughter, uh, a young girl. And they had soundproofed the wall between my room and the next room. Uh, so my room was almost soundproof, like a recording studio in a sense. So if somebody was yelling or screaming anywhere in the house, you couldn't hear it in my room. Jesus. So it explained kind of why. But, you know, where, where the poker game was was the opposite end of the house. I mean, you're talking through, I mean, you had to go through a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, uh, a hallway, a sunroom yeah. to where the poker game was. Plus soundproofing. Yeah. Plus soundproofing, plus early morning. But as the evidence came out, we know that Jerry Sturman should have been the last one to leave. He wasn't. Through testimony, we found out that people were waiting in the wings to enter the house and attack my parents. Um, all of this came out years and years and years later. Okay. But I think what a lot of your listeners may find interesting is that why wasn't Jerry Sturman considered a suspect? Here's a man who owed my father off a half a million dollars. He threatened my father. And within days of the attack on my parents, he fled the jurisdiction. He fled New York under one of his five aliases. He told his family he'd be swimming with the fish. He faked his own death. He fled from New York to New Jersey. From New Jersey, he flew out to California. He changed his appearance in California, was hiding out in a psychiatric retreat. And when he called home, he said one word, pistachio, to let his family know he was alive. And the reason why pistachio is relevant is pistachio was his favorite ice cream. So you you have the business partner of my father, who cleans out a joint bank account, flees the jurisdiction under one of five aliases, fakes his own death, tells his family he's going to be swimming with the fish, you know, goes all... But he's never considered a suspect. That's crazy. And the reason why we now know he was never considered a suspect was is that there was a relationship based on all the testimony that came out publicly that the lead detective and Jerry Stewart, who was my father's business partner, were associates. They were friendly with each other. Uh... 
And we also learn that McCready, who is the lead detective, based on public testimony, this is not me making these claims, based on public testimony by witnesses, McCready was paid $100,000 to keep Stuerman's name out of it and focus on me. Jesus. Okay, so, so by the looks of it, that was an arrangement that was made before, before the murder? Yes. This was prearranged before the murders um, by Jerry Sturman, Todd Sturman, Todd Sturman's associates, because we know all this to be true because eventually uh, a private investigator conducted an independent investigation on my behalf. And what he did was is that he tracked Todd Sturman's down, Todd Sturman down and he focused on all of his criminal associates, okay. which was never done. I mean, nobody ever focused, law enforcement never conduct an investigation. Uh, as some would say, is they had institutional blinders where they focused on me and nothing else. And when this private investigator started to identify some of the criminal associates of Todd Sturman, he identified uh, Glenn Harris. Glenn Harris was in jail, and the investigator went to see Glenn Harris in jail. And Glenn Harris said, I've been waiting for this day for whatever, it was 10, 11, 12, 13 years. And the investigator said, why? He goes, I was the getaway driver that night. And he finally solidified what we had partially known and partially believed for all these years. Because from day one, myself, my family, always said it was Stuerman. Because in the 80s, you know, if you looked at homicides, it was generally who benefits financially. Hmm. And Jerry Stuerman was the one person who benefited financially immediately from these murders. Right. Hmm. Um, did, uh, okay, okay, yes, so, yes, yeah, so you, you, you come in, do, do, do you remember, um, do you, do you remember how you felt just, just seeing this, this, uh, literally, um, literally a murder? I, I don't think you can describe it in words. Okay. It, it's one of those moments where reality doesn't exist. You know, the, you could, literally, you could be standing the ground underneath of you could be crumbling and you could be sinking. You wouldn't believe it's real because here it is, your own home, first day of high school. It's supposed to be a good day and I wake up to this. I didn't believe this was happening. I literally thought this was a nightmare. For sure. um, you know, we, we had experts evaluate and shock, disbelief, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we had an expert who came in who described that how he got interested in PTSD was when he was in the military, uh, all of a sudden one of his combat mates came back with a piece of a body part. And the guy walks into the tent and said, here's John. And he was actually completely normal. And the doctor said, he goes, some people who experience traumatic episodes can appear almost functioning normal, but it's almost like a zombie-like state because yeah. they're just functioning. They're not... They're not acting normal, but to the outside world, it may appear normal. And for me, I just couldn't believe what was happening. I was like, this, this isn't real. This can't be happening. And I think every step of the day when, you know, I, like, I want to go to the hospital. No, you can't go. It's like, wait a minute. Why can't I go? Like, that, that should be the normal course, right? You should be able to go to the hospital. If you have a family member who's sick or injured, you should go to the hospital. But that day, that wasn't the case. Law enforcement focused on me and me alone. Hmm. Okay, so when uh, when when law enforcement came, was it the that morning, right? Within a short period of time after I called nine one one, regular uniform officers showed up, and McCready also showed okay, up. That's what I was gonna ask. And the strange thing is, McCready wasn't the homicide detective on duty that day. Uh. He wasn't the assigned. He w he was supposed to be working at his construction site, but lo and behold, he showed up in a suit and tie, and he became the lead detective that day. And how we eventually found out that he wasn't the assigned, nobody ever told us this, the law enforcement never told us, a family member actually got access to some documents, and there was a confidential police log who identified who, like, the homicide detective, and it wasn't McCready, it was another detective, which just reinforced the fact that this was clearly prearranged, in my belief. I mean, listen... How could I not believe this knowing that he wasn't supposed to be assigned? He's friends with Sturman. Sturman fakes his death. I mean, there's all these little pieces that when you start putting them together, 
it paints a very clear picture that this was a prearranged hit arranged by Jerry Struman, Todd Struman, their criminal associates, on my parents. Right. I, I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners, just like a lot of people, would say, well, why was Marty left alive? Right? It's, it's always a valid question. Jerry Struman was the one who benefited immediately, not me. I mean, people said, oh, Marty, you're gonna, you benefit from the wills. I didn't benefit from my parents' wills until I was 25. So the way my parents' wills were structured is if something happened to my father, everything went to my mother. If something happened to my mother, everything went to my father. If something happened to both my parents, it just went into like a trust. But if I was attacked, who's left? Who benefits financially? Jerry Stuman. Jerry Stuman would have been the focus then. That's why I had to be left alive. Ah, I see. I see. Because if I was killed too, who's the only other person that you would look at? You would have to focus on who benefits financially. Yeah. That's why I was left alive. Jesus. That was absolutely mad. How, sorry, how did... um. Um, how, how did he fake his death and how and, and, and when did it come out? Within a few days, within five or six, maybe less than 10 days. Within a few days, he cleaned out a joint bank account. He like ripped off a gold chain. He left his car running. He left his door open. Somehow, that was in New York. And then from New York, he went to New Jersey. From New Jersey, he flew out to California. And in California, back then, he had a hair weave. So he belonged to, let's say, Hair Club of America. Instead of going to Hair Club of America, which would have a record of it, he went somewhere else, had his hair changed. Then he went to hide out in a psychiatric retreat. And I remember when I heard that, you know, he called home and said the word pistachio, that Suffolk County claimed they could track him down. Every law enforcement person I've ever spoken to said, in 1988, if somebody said pistachio and hung up, there was no way you could track them down. You know, it was just everything about his disappearance, them finding him, and then bringing him back just raised so many questions that I don't know if we'll ever get true answers to. And I think that's what's, for me, is, is it was one of the true tragedies of my case, is that there are still so many unanswered questions. And you know, this is an epidemic in wrongful convictions, that so many of us get exonerated, we know who the true perpetrators are, and law enforcement does nothing about it. Hmm. Okay, yeah. I, I, I mean, I could see, even if, even if members of uh, law enforcement w- w- weren't involved, but, but, but they still have to uh, kind of cover for themselves, e- e- even, even if they weren't, it didn't have anything to do with it. Like, like the detective that should have been on that day, I mean, there would have to be something... So, so if you want me to delve a little bit deeper into the, not even the conspiracy, these are just facts. McCready, who was the lead detective, who wasn't assigned, showed up that day. When the DA at that time, Tom Spoda, was in private practice, he represented McCready in a criminal case. So now all of a sudden, during my post-conviction hearings, you have Tom Spoda, who was McCready's former lawyer. He was also the former lawyer of the Stewarmans. So how could, you know, Tom Spode be independent? Yeah. But, you know, I don't know how much your listeners know about Tom Spoda or Chief Burke. Tom Spoda is currently in prison. Really? Uh, the And he was the sitting district attorney in Suffolk County that fought to keep me in prison. Uh, Chief Burke, James Burke, who was the chief of police during the post-conviction proceedings, He himself also went to prison. So the two people that were somewhat instrumental in fighting to keep me in prison both went to prison themselves. One of Tom Spode is there now. For unrelated things. Unrelated things, but for conduct they committed while in office, while on the job. And to me, that just should speak volumes about my case is that, you know, this, you know, what happened in in the case that led them to go to prison, I think was just the tip of the iceberg. And I think if you delve deeper into it, you'll probably find that that was not the first time they had some type of criminal misconduct that could have sent them to prison. But, you know, as the, as the number one prosecutor in the county, as the number one law enforcement officer, you really are king. Mm. You're king. You're unstoppable. 
everyone fears you. you. Um, and I know in my case, that's happened. There was a lot of intimidation that occurred by law enforcement. Uh, there were three young women that testified against me. They all lied. But we also found out that McCready intimidated them to lie. And we didn't uncover their lies. I knew they were lying when they testified. The problem is, is that we couldn't prove it other than to show that they said I was at their house on a particular day. I was able to show that it was virtually impossible. But it wasn't until I got out of prison that we were able to speak to at least one of the three who said we all lied. And I think it just demonstrates how wrong the system is on so many levels because you know people say well why would they do this or this doesn't happen it happens so often you know i think people just don't understand how often innocent men and women are convicted wrongfully convicted Mm. and i really hate calling it a wrongful conviction because there's nothing wrongful about it it's intentional it really is it's an intentional act in so many of these cases Innocent men and women end up in prison because the conduct by law enforcement, the conduct by prosecutors are intentional acts. They're not wrongful. It's not a mistake. It's not like... They don't think they have the right guy. No. I mean, in so many... Listen, here's this case, my case. You had the business partner who owed money, who faked his own death, threatened my my father's life, benefited financially had the means, had the resources, had actually hired Hells Angels bikers in the past to commit violent acts, but he was ignored. But instead, they focused on me, the son who just turned 17, who had no violent acts, had no interest, had no beneficial gain, nothing, nothing. There was no, there was no gain for me. I had just turned 17. Yeah. I remember at one point, somebody in law enforcement said, well, Marty did it for the money. My aunt said, my, aunt, my mother's sister said, what was he supposed to do from 17 to 25? It's a long period of time. You know, and, and I remember my Aunt Mary said, she goes, it would have been much easier if we believed he was guilty. We could just write him off. Right. Write him off. But we know he's not. Yeah. Are you an only child? Only so- uh, I have a half-sister okay. from my father's previous marriage who benefited financially from my conviction. So she and I don't speak. I don't really even consider her. She really? she flipped. She ended up going into business with the lead detective, McCready. Um, so if you think about who benefited financially from my conviction, my half-sister, the lead detective that put me in prison, and my father's business partner. Those three people benefited with you know, some very quickly, but within two years of my conviction, all three of those people benefited financially while I was sitting in a prison serving a sentence of 50 years to life. Oh, my God. Oh, okay, w- w- was she living in the house at the time, too? No, my half sister, um, Shari, was married, had her own kids, and okay, so she wasn't living in the house. Fair enough. You got to eliminate her. From, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but listen, we had witnesses come forward that said she knew the murderers. She used to live in the same town as them. Uh, we've never been able to prove that there was a connection. Sure. But these are not things that people just randomly make up. You know, I remember during my case at one point, the prosecutor said, oh, witnesses are coming forward just to get their 15 minutes of fame. And, you know, we all looked at that and kind of said, how effing ridiculous is that how many people would inject themselves into a double homicide for 15 minutes of fame you know it it was actually the most opposite point is that if you were injecting yourself there was a sense of truthfulness there was a there, there was there was a veracity to everything they said and what was most i think interesting about everything is that the information that connected sturman and todd sturman started in back in like 1992, 1993. So a few years after I was convicted, Joseph Creedon was at a party where he admitted to being one of the murderers. He confessed to somebody, to Carlin Kovacs, and Carlin Kovacs came to us. So from 1992, 93, 
We continuously brought forward information to the Suffolk County DA's office, and they chose nothing to do with it. And every time we brought information, it constantly pointed to the Stormans or the lead detective McCready. Jesus Christ. That's mad. Um, okay, so uh, you uh, you discovered them, called the police, got brought to the police station. C- c- can you describe for me... Um, what the what the interrogation was like this the, the, the their attempt it, to get a, it's to it's get a very story. hard to describe i mean imagine being locked away a windowless room with two veteran detectives whose ultimate goal is to get you to confess they want you to admit your guilt in in, in Suffolk county um they had a reputation of having the highest confession rate of any homicide bureau in America. Wow. Um, That's quite often how they solve cases. It wasn't through forensics, it was through confessions. Uh, It was so bad that the state actually ended up investigating them because at one point, I remember the homicide squad, they would go to their annual football, I mean, I think it was softball league, and they wore a shirt that thing said 97% or 99% on, on their sleeves, and that was to indicate how much of their confession rate was. But for your listeners, you know, they, they say, well, I would never confess for something I never did. I try to tell them bullshit, right? And, and, and to, to really understand false confessions, you have to simplify it or make it very basic. And the easiest way to do that is, and I, and I do this in large crowds, is you take a room full of 100, 150, 200 people, and you say, okay, how many people have siblings stand up? Those standing, when you were a child, you and your siblings were home, and let's say your parents went out, a lamp broke, a plate broke, something broke. Your parents come home and they say, well, we're not going out for ice cream, we're not going out for whatever, until somebody says, who broke whatever, right? How many of you in this room says, you broke the lamp, you broke the plate because you want to go out for ice cream? Remain standing. Amazingly, 50% of the people are still standing. And I go, you just confessed to something you didn't do. Imagine that. That's for ice cream. That's for ice cream. Imagine the consequences being a million times worse where law enforcement tells you we'll execute you, we'll send you to prison, we know you did it, there's physical abuse, there's psychological abuse, the interrogation can last hours or days, and you constantly are saying, I didn't do anything, and law enforcement says, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to, we know you did it, Marty, just tell us you did it. After a while, you start to almost believe what they're telling you, even though in your head you know it's not true. But you also want to, you want out of that interrogation room. You want this to end. You want the the physical abuse. You want the psychological abuse to end. You want to get out of there. So you start almost regurgitating whatever they're telling you. If they told you that you jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge and the interrogation would end, you'll say, I jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge because you want the interrogation to end. I don't remember what the defining point of the end of the interrogation was, but I remember it It stopped at some point. I remember I spoke to my half-sister. I remember I spoke to my godfather, Uncle Mike, Mike Box. Was there a lawyer ever there? No, no. Um, Every time I asked to speak to Mike Fox, who was the family attorney, he was a lawyer, uh, I was told I was a criminal and I'd be going to prison for life. So I had just turned 17. There was no parent. There was no guardian. There was no lawyer. You were say, I mean, you, it, 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 it can't be ignored that like you, you, you literally just experienced one of the most traumatic things that a, that a person could at 17. At 17. And if you speak to law enforcement experts who have some integrity or you speak to false confession experts, or you speak to lawyers who actually do this, they will tell you. They took the most vulnerable kid they could find, essentially. Me, who had just discovered my mother and my father this way, isolated him and kept him away from everybody. And their job was to get a confession. And if you think back to McCready showing up when he wasn't assigned, McCready being paid to keep Sturman's name out of it, McCready taking me to police headquarters... McCready's job was to get some kind of confession. And what I've said all along is that Suffolk County had a policy procedure in place where they were supposed to electronically record 
interviews and interrogations and homicide cases, especially if you thought the person you were interrogating was the defendant. Right, right. They chose not to. And for me, if you choose not to electronically record what you're doing, what, why? you're hiding. Yeah. Um, and, why, why and you? you know, if you're not doing anything wrong, don't be afraid. Yeah. Don't be afraid to do it. Um, tragically, though, we see this time and time again is when law enforcement chooses not to electronically record everything. Um, you know, and we're not talking about recording, you know, the last 10 minutes after they've, you know, browbeat you for five hours. I'm talking about from the first question. And I remember I was somewhere where somebody in law enforcement says, well, it costs too much to record an interrogation. This was, you know, since I've been free. And, and I kind of said, well, how many hours can I record on my cell phone? Are you telling me that it's too expensive to record an interrogation, which you don't do every day, but the cost of the recording equipment and whatever you're saving is worth more than my life? I said, wait a minute. If you would have recorded what happened in that room, I would not have been charged. I would not have been in prison for 18 years. So I say, there, there's, there's no cost you can put on someone's life, especially recording equipment. Yeah. And then I heard at one point, well, we don't want suspects to know what we're doing in the interrogation room, so we don't record it. I think it's a very simple answer. If you're not doing anything illegal or wrong, don't be afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, so they they pressure and kind of harass you and, and eventually eventually force out a uh, force out a false confession. Um what what happened what what happened from there? They they they're like, "Okay, we have a Hour, hours later, I was taken to a police precinct. Um sometime after that, I was brought to court. And in New York, you were arraigned on the charges, so I was brought before a judge. Uh, bail application was made for my release to my family. It was denied. Uh, I was taken to the Suffolk County Jail. Um, at some point when I was in the Suffolk County Jail, the lawyers had made uh, additional applications for bail, which were eventually granted. So I was eventually released on a million dollars bond, uh, and I was freed until I was found guilty on June 20th, 1990. So, say from October 1st, maybe I got out. I don't, I don't remember exactly how I got out on bail, but let's say October 1st of 1988 till June 28th of 1990, I was free. I see. I see. Jesus. Um, okay, so so th- those two years, um, I mean, did, did they... Uh, what and like like what do they consist of? You like like preparing preparing for a trial. I I I'd imagine. Uh, I was de- dealing with. Dealing with I was office. living with family. Um, I was being homeschooled because Port Jeff High School didn't want me on the grounds, and I didn't want to be on the grounds because we didn't trust anybody. Uh, I was also preparing for trial, uh, and then. Let me see. March, April, May. I think it was. In 1989, we had a hearing, which was called a Huntley hearing, which the judge was to assess whether or not the statements that law enforcement attributed to me were voluntary. Uh, To make matters even more chaotic, my lawyer was, was running for the district attorney of Suffolk County, and the judge who was hearing my case was in contention for being the Republican nominee for district attorney. So if you want to understand, you know, here it is, is that here's this judge who's possibly going to become the Republican nominee who's hearing my case. So if he rules in my favor, he essentially is saying that he didn't trust law enforcement. So you could guarantee he wouldn't get the Republican nominee. If he ruled, you know, for me, if he ruled against me, he was saying that he trusted law enforcement. So just based on those simple facts, you can almost know exactly which way he was going to rule. Uh, He did. He ruled against me, and he ruled law enforcement was telling the truth. About a year later, in the middle of 1990, maybe April, we started jury selection. Uh, The jury selection process was about four weeks because my case was very high profile in Suffolk County. So trying to pick a jury and alternatives was difficult. Uh, and then we had about eight weeks of trial. 
Okay, okay. Uh, sorry, j j just go back a little sure. bit. Um, j during the two years between um, uh, between the murders and the and the trial, um, were were you thinking, were you thinking, okay, look, I've made the 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 they forced this this BS confession out of me. Um, but were you thinking, okay, it'll it'll uh, it'll be seen for what it is, um, and I have a good chance of getting off? Or what? What, what did you kind of think of your of your chances? I was thinking innocent people don't get convicted, and the truth would come out. But I also thought that I was dealing dealing with a fair system. Hmm. I thought I was dealing with ethical prosecutors. I was thought I was dealing with ethical police, objective judges, yeah. uh, fair and objective judges who were not biased or swayed. Boy, was I wrong. <sighs> On so many levels, um, from you know bad prosecutors to dirty cops to unethical judges. Uh, I mean, you know, the stories of what happened to me will shock people. I mean, you know, during the jury deliberation process, we had jurors who have alleged that one juror in particular was giving hand signals to the prosecutor of which way guilty versus not guilty. After I was found guilty, we had people come forward saying that they were victory celebrations that included the prosecutor, the lead detective, and the judge. And these were not just average citizens. Some of these people were lawyers, businessmen. Once again, you know, people who would not inject themselves if this wasn't true. Um, and, and the scary thing is that people had a hard time believing it was true. And I would say, why would anybody make this stuff up? It, you, know, you would just not make your, you know, you wouldn't make this up. You wouldn't say this is just, you know, I, I saw something. I mean, people were very descriptive. They knew locations, days, who was there, you know, even some of what was said at during some of these events. You know, and once again, you know, the problem is in Suffolk County is after you're convicted, any of those motions go before the same judge. So we had to go before the judge that we were accusing of being part of celebratory luncheons or dinners. So you knew I was not going to yeah. get any relief that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So you, you, you said the, the trial went how long? Uh, about 12 weeks between jury selection and the trial itself. Okay, um, and throughout it, um, d did you have any sense of, like, momentum is going in our direction, it's looking good, it's looking bad? You know, throughout the whole process, I remember everybody used to always say is that the longer jury deliberations go, the more likely it is for a not guilty verdict. Okay. And all of a sudden, the jury deliberations went day one, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight. And they came back, they said they had a verdict. Now, after you've been told for a very long time that the long jury deliberations go, you think, okay, it's going to be a good verdict. Over a week, yeah. Uh, it wasn't, obviously, because they came back with two guilty verdicts that sent me to prison for 50 years to life. And the sad thing was is that some of the jurors were spoken to afterwards. And they were asked, why did you vote guilty? Well, we thought he was guilty. And we, and we, it was like, you thought he was guilty? Did you yeah, fail to understand the, the, the concept of beyond a reasonable doubt? There had to be no question about it. They just didn't get it. Uh, I think jurors have a very difficult time in America understanding our criminal justice system. I think the concept of beyond a reasonable doubt is a difficult legal standard that some people just don't understand. Mm. Um, you know what, if you want to simplify it, basically you can't have any doubt, no questions whatsoever. You have to be 99.9% sure, sure that somebody's guilty. If there's any room for doubt, then no. Then no. But most jurors don't believe that because they automatically believe if there's an individual sitting at a defendant's table, he must be guilty of something. It's... Right. I hate to say it, I think it's kind of, you know, within our psychology that we automatically assume, which we shouldn't, that if somebody's sitting at a defendant's table, they're a defendant, they've been charged, they must be guilty of something. Yeah, there's a good reason why they're there. 
but it's wrong. Um, you know, since 1989, we have documented wrongful convictions in the United States according to the National Registry of Exonerations. On average, I think for every year since then, we've probably had to be between 130 to 180 people exonerated every year. Wow. It's a number that should really scare people. Even in a country with this big. You know, you we could say that America has the best criminal justice system, but it's human. Of course, yeah. Humans make faults. The problem is that so often when we identify some of the problems in the system, there's very little corrective action that takes place. So when you can identify, you know, okay, there's a bad prosecutor, there's a bad cop, um, there's not much we do. There's not much accountability in our system. It's not like in a hospital system if somebody dies – there's usually some kind of sentinel review where people are, you know, there's a review process. We understand what happened. Some people could be sanctioned. Really, if ever does that happen in the United States. Huh, yeah. And I think we've learned that sometimes when you have a very bad cop, and we, we know that this happened in Brooklyn with Detective Louis Scarcella, who's been involved in 15 or 20 wrongful convictions. Um it, it should really get the ire of people. People should start saying, what the hell is going on? Hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, eight days of deliberation, jury comes back. Do you remember Do you remember the feeling in that moment when they, uh, when, when they dropped the hammer? What I remember is being brought to the Suffolk County Jail and staying in front of the property room officer, and the property room officer is saying, what are you doing here? And I remember saying, why else would I be here? And whoever it was said, there's no way they found you guilty. And I go, why else would I be here? That's what I remember. I don't even remember the guilty, you know, the guilt. I don't, I don't remember them saying guilty in the courtroom. Sure. I remember just somebody standing face to face saying, why are you here? And I, why else would I be here? Okay. Because I think it was just such a blow. Because there's no way I could believe that the system could fail so bad. But I also didn't understand how corrupt the system was. Okay. You know, I was this innocent kid who grew up to trust law enforcement, you know, believe that the system works. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, we as a society have really started, at least the last 10, 15 years, to understand that the system is so far from ideal. fair, so far from ideal. Uh, you know, when you have people who are being trained, you know, don't trust prosecutors, don't trust cops, they're not your friends. Uh, it's, it's sad. I mean, I grew up, my, my father was the police commissioner for the community we lived in. So I grew up in an environment where I was to trust law enforcement, you know, I was trusting police. I, I can't do that anymore. Hmm. You know, and I know I know I'm not alone in this because we see it time and time again. You know, as a criminal defense lawyer now, and somebody who works on these cases and works on wrongful conviction, I probably see it every day. I probably see where officers, you know, say one thing, and all of a sudden you get a body camera video or a surveillance video, and it shows something completely different. Hmm. Uh, and I, I think people need to understand that. Need to understand that. You have to basically challenge everything. It's very difficult to accept until it's proven. Sure, sure. And look, if, if it's if it's true and if you challenge it, then then okay. Then it's, okay. It's true. But you know, for the longest, law enforcement agencies around America were reluctant to utilize videotapes to electronically record interviews and interrogations. But what was amazing was in so many law enforcement agencies where there was this pushback, when they all of a sudden started to utilize them, there was less allegations of false confessions. There was less allegations of police abuse. Right. You know, all of a sudden, the system worked a little bit better because okay. there was accuracy in the system. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that is missed a great deal is that, you know, people want to see what's really happening. You know, it's yeah. one of the reasons why in America we, we talk about open courtrooms and courtrooms are available to the public because we want the public to see what it's like. Okay, so transparency. You want to see transparency. And if you're not doing anything illegal or doing anything wrong, what's the, what, what are you hiding? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, 
um you get convicted do you remember um um do you remember that first that first day of being walked into into prison where where was it Rikers Island or upstate Suffolk County it was the Suffolk County jail for, for, for the whole 18 for all of Suffolk County so okay. Suffolk County is the east end of Long Island New York um the courthouse had a tunnel that goes underground to the jail Okay. So for you know if somebody gets convicted or they're housed there, it's very easy. They just walk them through a tunnel to get to the jail. At least that's what I think it was back then. I see. It may still be. You, you you spent your eighteen years there? No, no. So you know I was in the county jail till the middle of October um, because in October uh, Judge Tish sends me to fifty years to life. From the Suffolk County Jail, you go to Downstate Correctional Facility. Uh, which is a the first state prison you get to. And, you know, you get to the state prison and you get the welcome speech. Basically, you're not a name, you're not a person, you're a number. Um, I was 90 T, 38, 44, which meant in 1990, I was the 13,844th person to be processed through Downstate Correctional Facility. Um, so that number, 90T3844, was my ID number for the entire time I was in the New York State Department of Corrections. That's crazy. I, I, is it like the warden who's giving you this speech? Uh, no, the officers. I see. Um, and every jail you go to, you can get a welcome speech. I mean, I, I remember very vividly the Clinton Correctional Facility welcome speech. It was a small group of this. This was probably 1993. Um, I was transferred to Clinton from Auburn Correctional Facility. And when I got there, the welcome speech was, you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. If we're not husband, wife, father, son, brother, cousin, we're friendly with one of another. Mess with one of us, you will reap the consequences. Which was basically telling you, you touch one of us, there's nowhere you can go to hide. Um, pretty impactful speech because you realize you are 45 minutes south of the Canadian border. You're away from everybody. And if something happens to you, it's not like, you know, somebody can come visit you very quickly. I mean, these were speeches where they put the fear of God in you that they could make you disappear if they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. They can make something look like an accident. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so how does uh, Jesus? What <laughs> what is it like for a young um, guy from 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 not a rough from not a rough area who isn't who isn't uh, well equipped with the the ways of the streets and so on? Uh, how, how does that go? Very big learning curve, um, but very early on, I had a few people who uh, knew about me because my case was very high profile. Gave me a few pieces of advice, like don't get involved in gangs, drugs, gambling. They said, you know, the system is easily convicts an innocent person, but it takes a very strong-willed person and a big fight to exonerate somebody. So very early on, I realized, okay, don't do X, Y, and Z, but do this, which was do this was, you know, enter the college programs when they existed and spend as much time in the law library as I could. So eventually I ended up getting a job in the law library and every jail I went to, I worked in the law library because I knew that I wasn't going to die in prison and have the legacy that Seymour and Arlene Tangliff were murdered by their son. I knew that wasn't going to be the legacy. The legacy was Marty was going to be wrongfully convicted. He was going to be exonerated and the truth would get out there. And that's what I did for almost 18 years. Every day was a day where I fought to get out. I mean, since day one, basically from day one, I mean the there were some op- roller coaster rides. I remember, you know, every time I got a negative decision from a court, there was about a twenty four hour period where I had like a rock bottom because I I felt how could this be? And that was especially because in nineteen ninety three, uh, there was a the appellate division split on their decision. Two judges voted to basically reverse my conviction dismiss the indictments and set me free. Really? Three judges voted against me. What was more troubling was is that when we argued before that court, it started off as four judges. And the four judges split 2-2. Two, two, and the fifth judge that they brought on um, had a connection to Suffolk County. Right. 
So when the decision came out, when we realized he was the fifth judge, we said, this doesn't shock us. But every court I appealed to, we thought we were finally going to get some relief. I mean, you know, in New York, you go from the appellate division to the New York State Court of Appeals. Then you can go to the you can go to the United States Supreme Court. You can go to the Federal District Court. You can go to the Circuit Court of Appeals. I went up and down. I mean, I went you know, to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, back down to Suffolk County Court for hearings, back up. And it was about 1998, 99, when the court system had continued to fail me, the lawyers that were representing me said, what's never been done? And what was never done was a true investigation. And that's when I started to try to find a private investigator. And I found one and he said, if you're innocent, hire me. If you're not, don't waste my time. I said, where do I sign? Sign on the dotted line. And that's where the, the whole process started where he said, okay, who benefited financially? Jerry Stewartman. Todd Sturman was his son, and all of a sudden he started branching out. And all of a sudden we started to accumulate one witness after another, after another, after another. And we believed we actually had enough witnesses to convince the Suffolk County DA's office. But you have to remember, it was Tom Spoda. Yeah. Spoda was connected to Jerry Sturman and McCready. So... Even presenting them with the evidence without even going to court, they did nothing with it. Uh, eventually, we had to file a post-conviction motion in Suffolk County, and the judge ended up granting a hearing. Yeah. And we had 18 months of hearings, probably 24 to 30 witnesses. Jeez. And on St. Patrick's Day of 2007... Uh, Judge Braslow ruled against me and basically said that I didn't establish enough to show my innocence or grant a new trial. He said that I had brought forth uh, a cavalcade of nefarious scoundrels. Uh, what was always really disturbing was this cavalcade of nefarious scoundrels included a priest, <laughs> a nun, a lawyer, oh, businessmen. Some of them were people with criminal histories, but some of them were also people with criminal histories that law enforcement had used in like undercover work. Right. Um, and you know, a group of those people actually held a big press conference and said, "We're this cavalcade of nefarious scoundrels." Uh, thankfully, in New York, though, we appealed that decision okay. to the appellate division, who granted permission. So in New York. If you file a post-conviction motion in a lower court, you can only appeal that decision if you're given permission. It's not automatic. Thankfully, I was given the, the right to appeal everything. Uh, I appealed it, and on December 21st, 2007, I found out what the decision was. And thumbs up? Uh, well, it was a very interesting day. So I knew it was a Friday, December 21st. You're... you're you're still living in prison. I'm in prison. I'm in Comstock Correctional Facility, Great Meadow. Uh, I knew the case was argued, and every day from the case, from the day the case was argued, I would call home, like any decision, any decision. And I knew December 21st was the last day of the year they could actually release decisions. <laughs> and I called in the morning. It's a Friday, and I remember saying, no decision, no decision. Finally, I called back in the afternoon because I worked in the law library. We had phones in the law library. And I remember speaking to somebody who's working on my case, Roz. And she's like, we won. And I kind of said, what did we win? She goes, I don't know. I go, Roz, we had four separate appeals. What one did we win? She goes, I don't know. So here I was knowing that there was some good news. Heart beating like yeah, it's like kind of. But it was also that moment, too, of like, is this real? Like, am I really having this phone call? And because one of the appeals was because the lower court denied my right to do DNA testing, right. you know. So I didn't know. Okay, did I did I win on that? I just, it was just DNA. finally I got hold of one of the lawyer's offices, and the receptionist said, "Don't tell Bruce I told you, but it's the big one." So I knew what that meant. Like I knew it was it was either a new trial, it was dismissing the indictments. And I eventually got on the phone with Bruce Barquette, who was one of the lawyers who 
uh, was the lawyer who represented me during the hearings. And I remember him, and I tell him to this day, he said, pack your shit, you'll never see the inside of a jail cell again. Mm. And there was something about it which was just, I don't know, vivid or me being sarcastic at that moment just to kind of see if it was really real. I said, well, Bruce, you know, I know enough about the law. I'm going to say it's an oral contract that you were going to have, and I'm going to you know, hold you to it bonding. He goes, trust me on this one. And... I remember it was still hard to believe it was true, but all of a sudden when I eventually left the law library that day, the whole jail knew about the decision because it became public. Oh, okay. I had lawyers calling up to the jail trying to speak to me who I couldn't get a hold of because they were traveling. And it really hit home on Saturday. Saturday morning, one of the correctional officers that I knew brought me the newspaper of all the major newspapers. And I was on the front page of it, every single newspaper. Hmm. And it was that moment it kind of just, that it was real. I was like, holy sh! like after all these years, I'm finally going to go home. I'm going to have my day, What you know. But I remember thinking like, well, how long is this going to take? Yeah. And I didn't know at that very moment, but my lawyers had actually spoken to the prosecutor who said, oh, no, you know, it could take a few months to get Marty down here. And I'm thinking, like, a few months? Like, what do you mean a few months? But my lawyer was able to get a court order from the judge, got it to the sheriff's, and the sheriff's picked me up on December 26th at Great Meadow Correction Facility. They drove me down to Suffolk County, New York. And the following morning, I was brought into court, and I was freed. And I have never looked back since. That's amazing. So just since December 27, 2007, I n- have not looked back. I mean, since I've been out, within a few weeks, I you know, restarted my college education. I got my bachelor's degree. I got a law degree. Uh, became a lawyer, professor at Georgetown. I- I- I've walked you know, through our class at Georgetown, which is called Making an Exoneree. My childhood friend Mark Howard and I have walked three innocent people out of prison. Amazing. So it really is a long hurdle and a long struggle. Marathon was 18 years. Um, 6,338 days to be exact. I was in prison. But, you know, one of my lawyers helped put things in perspective, you know, not too long ago. He said, Marty, he goes, where are you today? I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're a professor. You're a lawyer. You're free. People that kept you in prison, right? are either dead or in prison themselves. So if you believe in karma, if you believe in retribution, if you believe in kismic energy, those who destroyed your life for a period of time and tried to kill you, because that's what they did. Suffolk County, prosecutors, law enforcement, the judges tried to kill me because when you sense an innocent kid who just turned, was 19 years old, of 50 years to life. That means my first eligibility would have been 69. I would have been 69. And, you know, if you can survive 50 years in prison and make parole, I mean, it's pretty shocking. But to me, it was a death sentence. It's a death sentence. And, you know, if I think back on it, um, they tried to kill me. Really, what they tried to do is there wasn't a death penalty on the books in you know, 88, 89, 90 in Suffolk County. But if there was, I would have been sent to death row because when the death penalty was reinstituted in New York, Suffolk County actually sent the most people to death row in really? New York State, yes. Really? Um, um, okay, so uh, like 18 years in prison, I mean, that was pretty much uh, the amount of years that you had lived previous you know okay so so the the maturation period that that i should have gone through i should have graduated high school college first job second job all that stuff you know that's what people don't understand you know i got out when i was 37 in many ways i was an adult but i was also a kid because there were things that i missed you know there was so much that i missed i remember a year after i got out i did a semester abroad in venice italy and it was very interesting because some of the people that I went with had no idea who I was, but I was this 
38 year old man doing a semester abroad in Venice, Italy with all these college kids. Right. Um, you know, and I always tell a funny story because I think a lot of people would enjoy this is that, you know, I didn't feel 38 because I'd missed out so much. So here I was, I was in college classes. And, you know, if anybody has done a semester abroad, you go out drinking a lot. And I remember one of the first nights we went out to a bar. They, somebody who didn't know who I was said, oh, the old guy's not going to be able to hang out every night with us. Probably the wrong thing to say for somebody who just, you know, spent 18 years in prison and, you know, and, and fought their way out. I always say, listen, I hung out every night in the bar, got back to my hotel room every night, never fell in the canal and got up for class every morning. So, you know, those people who challenged this 38-year-old guy back then probably won't do it again. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so g- given, Jesus, given that you spent 18 years around, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, sure, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure the majority of people in there are correctly convicted and you're probably, you're, you're spending your time with, like, the top 1% of violent, volatile, <clears throat> what, wait, did, would... Would that change you as a person? I mean, just just even surviving 18 years around all these characters? It does. Uh, you know, you become very judgmental of a lot of people. I remember the acclimation period for me when I first got out was very difficult. I imagine. Um, I remember crowds I didn't like. Um, I wasn't familiar with technology. <laughs> um, going food shopping. I remember I was being interviewed by Rosanna Scotto on the streets of New York City and I said to her, I said, why are, you know, why, why are these people talking to themselves? I go, I thought I left all the crazy people behind. She goes, what do you mean? I go, look, he's talking to himself. She goes, he's on the phone. I go, what are you talking about? He's on the phone. He's not holding a phone. It's a Bluetooth. Ah. I didn't know that. Right. You know, I didn't see it. In, so, like, literally, I thought people were just talking to themselves. I remember going to a supermarket and just spending hours and hours and hours there because in prison... You know, you have this commissary that you can buy food every two weeks, but you're limited. So, like, there was, you know, two or three choices of cereal. Now, all of a sudden, I get out, there's an entire aisle. Um, I remember, you know, going to one place where there was free samples. And I'm like, oh, my God, free samples. <laughs> and I would, like, literally, I'd walk around, like, whatever, like, this, like two or three times. I'm like, wait, free samples, free samples. But I remember one of the most challenging things for, for me was that I – enrolled at Haas University about three weeks after I got out. So here I was, this you know 37-year-old guy who's going to college classes with all these kids who were familiar with technology, had been in college classrooms. I wasn't. Right. So I remember every single class, I chose the seat closest to the door. And for a long time, I wouldn't take my jacket off because I used to say, I am a goldfish in a sea of sharks. I'm never going to survive this. Because I'm twice their age. I don't know what college classrooms are like. You know, I haven't, like, now I, I had an associate's degree, but my degree I obtained in prison yeah. with other guys who were convicted of crimes, you know, wrongfully or rightfully. So it was a much different environment. I mean, I wasn't familiar with technology at all. Hmm. Um, and between 88 and 2007 was a very technologically uh, significant time. I remember during the post-conviction hearings uh, when I was in the Nassau County Jail, I heard people talking about dial-up. I was like, what's dial-up? I'm like, you know, you mentioned it nowadays. People say, what's dial-up? I'm like, very, very slow internet. Um, But I remember feeling if I was going to succeed in life in this society, I had to acclimate very quickly. Like, learn technology, learn travel. I mean, there were all these things that I had to learn and then I had to figure out ways to overcome things. So I remember going to the DMV very early on and anybody who's been to the New York State DMV knows it can be problematic on so many levels. But I want to get a driver's license. So I remember walking in there thinking like, okay, I don't have six forms of ID. You know, they wanted, you know, cancel check. I mean, and I walked in with my, I think, my social security card, my birth certificate, my student ID from Hopps because I had a picture on it, right. um, and maybe one other item, and a newspaper article had my picture on it. Okay, okay. And they kind of looked at me and said, well, you know, do you, do you have a, you know, a, a stub from your employer? I'm like, Never had one. it was the state of New York. Do you have, like, you know, anything that you paid rent? I was like, state of New York. Didn't pay rent, yeah. didn't, like, and finally, a supervisor came over and said, 
Marty, we know who you are. Just show us what you've got and we'll, we'll, but that was one of those moments that I started thinking like, what if I wasn't a high profile? What if people didn't know who I was? I was stuck. But those were obstacles that I had to overcome. I mean, just, I mean, those are simple things. I remember going shopping and I remember because in prison, you're only allowed certain colors. You can only have certain types of clothing. So I remember going to a clothing store and kind of being like taken back, like, where do I start? Right. Like, oh my God, like there's all these colors, there's all these styles. I remember people saying, what size? I have no idea what size I was. Whatever I mean, one they gave me. In front yeah, of like, like I'm, I know my shoe size, that's about it. Like I, I know that for sure. Um, but it's a long process. You know, if anybody thinks acclimation comes quickly, it doesn't. Um, but I knew that as far back as 1993, because a lot of people said, you know, Marty, when you were growing up, you didn't want to become a lawyer. I said, no, I want to become a businessman. You know, my 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 family and, and friends were connected to, I, I tell people this sometimes reluctantly now, um, but Mike Fox was friends with Donald Trump's father. Oh, right. Fred. So, uh, Fred Trump. Right, right. And... I, as a kid, I wanted to go to the Wharton School of Business. I wanted to become an entrepreneur because growing up, that's what I did. I had sports memorabilia businesses. You know, very early on when I was in elementary school, I would find, you know, candy that was sold at discounts and I would bring it to school and undercut what was being sold at school. But as far back as 1993, I had a, my, my friend Eric was my neighbor. I can tell you exactly where I was. There was Clinton Correction Facility, uh, Three company, I was in six cell, he was seven cell, and he was serving 25 years to life, he was appealing his conviction, I was serving 50 years to life, and I was appealing my conviction. And we both said, we're both going to get out, we're both going to get our convictions reversed. He said, I'm going to get out, I'm going to live on the Upper West Side, I'm going to become an artist, I'm going to do this. I said, I'm going to get out, I'm going to become a lawyer, if I can, I'll become a professor too. Guess what? We both got our convictions reversed. Eric is out living on the Upper West Side. He's an artist. I'm out. I'm a lawyer. I'm a professor. I'm doing what I love. And people say, why? They say, you know, Marty, you could go open up a coconut shack on a beach somewhere, but no, you throw yourself right into the fire. The legal system again, yeah. And, you know, listen, I've walked back into the prisons where I was imprisoned at. And, you know, it, you want to feel anxiety, you know, the, the, the sounds of the gates, the metal gates slamming shut. And you know you have no control to open those gates. Very, very kind of one of those moments where you freeze for a split second. But I remember one of my lawyers said to me very early on, before I was a lawyer, he said, Marty, he said, you've got to do it. You want to become a lawyer, you're going to have to go into prisons. Just do it now. You know, get that and try to get those emotions out. And I remember the first time I went in, back into a jail... When I got out of the jail, there were officers that knew me and said, how does it feel? I go, what do you mean? He goes, you walk down on your own and free. And you want to feel this. It really feels like this weight's being lifted off of you. And it's one of the things that I vividly remember is that I wanted to make sure that there were no other Marty Tankless. Right. So to make that happen... I had to do this. I had to go back, become a lawyer, become a professor. I testified before legislative bodies throughout the country to try to get, you know, legislation passed that would have protected me because had that interrogation room been electronically recorded. That probably would have solved it, right? It would have solved it. People would have seen what actually happened. And that's so much so because we're going to talk about McCready for about a minute. I sat in when McCready was deposed for a civil rights lawsuit. And if you want to talk about such close-minded, at the very end, my lawyer said to him, you know, Detective McCready, if I showed you a video that showed you who killed Marty's parents and it wasn't Marty, would you still believe it was Marty? He said, yes. And that just goes to show you how law enforcement can be so stuck on somebody in the face of overwhelming evidence that somebody else committed a crime but what it really means is they're not willing to say they made a mistake right and that's what's so bad about this system is law enforcement doesn't want to admit they make mistakes yeah 
sorry, you, you, your friend who you grew up with, he also ended up falsely convicted for, for some. Which one? They, one they co-teach the class with? Yeah. No, no. So Mark Howard. You, you met him in prison. Who, no. So so which one? So so my neighbor, I didn't. Met, I met him in prison. I, Eric, I met in prison. Okay. Mark Howard is my childhood friend that I've known since we were three years old. We went to the Lovey Dovey preschool together. He was a tenured professor of government at Georgetown. Uh, and he wrote the first article for the Purple Paradise or a high school newspaper where he basically said, you know, Marty's presumed innocent, he's innocent. And after I was convicted and he went on with his life, he would tell people about my, you know, about me. And he eventually got back in contact with me. And he has completely changed his curriculum at Georgetown. He established a Prisons and Justice Initiative at Georgetown. He wrote a friend of the court brief for me. And he and I have been teaching this course at Georgetown called Make an Exonery ever since 2018. That's very good. Um, to, to, to take it back mm -hmm. a small bit, I mean, sure. if you hadn't, if you didn't have the access to the kind of money they'd given, given your parents were fairly wealthy, w w would any of that been possible? The hiring private detectives and so on? Like if you were just some, if you were just some fella from, so, from like a, a poor area, like. So everybody worked free. When I got out, when it, excuse me, everyone worked pro bono or partially pro bono from about 1993. So, you know, my trial lawyer was retained. My appellate lawyer was retained, even though he didn't get paid anywhere near the billable hours that they worked. Um, the lawyers that I hired in 1993 were paid a few thousand dollars because they figured, you know, it was basically partially pro bono. The investigator was paid a few thousand dollars as well, but they continued to work for free for years. Wow. Um, and that's why some of these lawyers that are out there that do pro bono work, you have to give them a lot of credit, a lot of respect for, sure. because it's thousands of hours of work they get put into these cases. And you know, if anybody says it's easy work, it's not. Um, it is extremely rewarding work, but it's definitely not easy work. I see. I see. Um, j j just another uh, another quick thing sure. about about adjusting uh, adjusting to life after prison. Um, I mean, uh, I I I'd imagine in prison uh, violence is fairly is fairly prevalent. W w was that a like 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 after I I'd imagine that like after eighteen years in prison, if some fella walking down the street looks at you, your 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 first thought would be, <sighs> there was a lot of violence because, but I was. I was very fortunate to avoid a lot of it because I worked in the law library most of the time. So I stayed away from it. But, you know, ever since I've been free, always very cognizant of where I am, who's around me, the way people act, the way people are looking. Uh, but it's funny. I've met people who said, you know, they were bartenders. You know, I know somebody was a bartender uh, before they became a lawyer, and they say they do the same thing. They said, as a bartender, you're always very observant. Who's coming in? What they're looking? And he says, "You do that now." I see. And so, in many ways, like I think I have a lot of the same perspectives that people who were in the people business are in. Okay. That you're always looking around you. Um, but it does, you know. You know, I remember the first few times taking a subway, not a comfortable feeling. Obviously, you're packed into this. You don't. There's no escape. Yeah. Uh, if something happens, you know. It's you, there's no plan. Like, what do you do if something happens? And I think. Over the years, it's something you've just, I don't want to become accustomed to, but you've learned to accept that there are some times you don't have complete control of your environment and you just have to go with that. Hmm. I see. Okay, so you um, you get out. Um, t to be fair, you, you kind of wasted no time in becoming uh, becoming a lawyer. D do you work... Um uh, do you work like exclusively with um, kind of false convictions? And uh, no, I actually do regular criminal work. I've represented people at trials and hearings. Um, I do focus on wrongful convictions. I do a lot of prisoners' rights litigation. Okay. Uh, but I was just, myself and Mark Howard were just hired as special counsel at Barquette Epstein, Kieran Alday, and Laturka. And we are focusing on wrongful convictions around the country uh, and civil rights and prisoners' rights cases. So I do a little bit of everything. Okay, I see. Um, has there been um, has there been any cases you came across that were as um, maybe the wrong word to use, but kind of outrageous and it, it like like it all your 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 story if if 
if if I saw in the movie, I, I I would think, God, this is like this is a bit unrealistic, you know. Um, nothing as outrageous as mine, but I can tell you the first case that Mark Howard and I were involved in as an exoneration is Valentino Dixon. Valentino Dixon, African American man, can uh, we'll start back years ago, twenty seven, long time ago, but let me, let me just start over. Uh, Valentino Dixon was the first exoneration of our making exoneree class oh, from Georgetown. Three days after Valentino was charged with the murder, Valentin, uh, Lamar Scott came forward three days after Valentino Dixon was charged. He said, I committed the murder. He said, I lost control of the gun, and it wasn't Valentino. Law enforcement didn't believe him. Valentino Dixon was eventually convicted, sentenced to, I think, 39 years to life. While he was in prison, Lamar Scott continued to say it was him. When Lamar Scott committed another crime, I think it was a manslaughter or murder, he said, had you actually listened to me back then, I wouldn't be able to commit this crime. Our students investigated it, found additional evidence. Our students uh, spoke to the original prosecutor in Valentino Dixon's case. Valentino was exonerated, and the day he was exonerated, September 19th, 2018, Lamar Scott pled guilty. Mm. So to me, that was one of the craziest cases because it just showed us institutional blinders. That you had Lamar Scott coming forward publicly on TV, nothing to gain. Yeah. There was nothing to gain for him to, saying, I lost control of the gun. It was me. It was me. And he continuously represented that it was him while Valentino Dixon spent 20 Seven years in prison for a murder he didn't commit. Jesus. That's because of institutional blinders and, and wrongdoing and intentional wrongdoing. Um, okay, so just just to wrap up, um, the people the people who are responsible for um, for your false conviction uh, between the judge, the DA, the the homicide detective, um, because you were. Um, because your your conviction was flipped, um, does that automatically mean that that they're now in 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 trouble b- because they were the ones who did it? No, no. There's there's no accountability. But if you want to go down that road, the original trial judge is dead. Lead detective is dead. Two of the people, Peter Kent and Joseph Creedon, who publicly been admitted uh, identifies the murderers, they're both dead. Uh. The prosecutor who fought to keep me in prison during the post conviction is Lenny Leto. He's dead. Tom Spoda, who was a district attorney, the, uh, who was Leto's boss, he's in prison himself right now. Unrelated thing. Unrelated thing. Uh, chief Burke, who was the chief of police during the post conviction hearings, he went to prison himself for, I think it was like 40 something months, related to what Tom Spoda is in prison for now. I see. So, but no one was held directly accountable for what happened to me. I see. It never happens. Or if it does happen, it's a very, very small percentage in America of accountability. And that's something that I wish would change. I wish there was some level of accountability. Um, we, We just don't see it, though. I see. I see. Um, Thank you very much for joining me. Um, Congratulations. a, a huge understatement i mean um i mean everything you went through was incredible e- e- even if you hadn't been falsely convicted just to just to continue on uh, continue on living life after uh, after what happened to your parents um so congratulations Thank you. um and the, the the work you're doing now seems uh um very very courageous to to go back into Go back into that world. I, I'd imagine if it was me, I, I'd never want to see a courtroom or a legal document or an, or an anything related to that. I have a lot of friends who say that to me all the time. They're like, why? And I go, you know, if I can save one person's life or make a difference in one person's life, it's all worth it. Um, and somebody helped me put that in perspective. Somebody, you know, recently made me think about what if I didn't go to prison? Um where would Valentino Dixon, Eric Riddick, or Keith Washington be? You know, two of my former students are working at the Innocence Project right now. They've been involved in several exonerations. Um, 
as some people have said, me going to prison has made this world a better place because of the work I've been able to do in the butterfly effect where people who have been my former students who get to go on and continue doing this work. So, you know, I have to focus on that. I have to focus on all the good that's come out of this, not the bad. Well, good for you.